right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM. Joining you as usual from beautiful blue skied San Diego and just over the border in Arizona, I'm joined by Keld Jensen, who is also under a blue sky, I'm sure. Probably a hotter mm. one. <laughs> a hotter one. I, I, I can promise you that. It's a hotter one. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And Kel has more than 30 years experience in international management, negotiation and communication from his post as a managing director of a listed Scandinavian company. And you have written how many books now, Kel? Uh, 24. 24 books, including one that just came out in April. Um, just check that here. That is called 101 Excuses That Will Block Your Success, How to Pick Yourself Up in the Midst of a Crisis and Talk About... Uh, Talk about a timely uh, book and a timely subject. So that book doing well, Cal? It is actually. And, and, and the reason I did it was specifically because of COVID, obviously, because I felt a lot of people were suddenly hitting directly into a almost depression thinking, you know, what's the future going to bring for me? So I thought, you know, uh, basically I could just base it on my own experience throughout life. You know, uh, what can we do? Yeah, absolutely. Great. And today we're going to talk about collaboration and negotiation. And um, let's face it, Cal, those two words in most people's minds don't particularly go together, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. a lot of people, they think of, well, collaboration, you know, we're gonna get our work together and all of it. Negotiation, it's more, I'm on one side of the table, you're on the other side of the table, and it is more of a, it's, it's got more conflict to it than collaboration. Hmm, yep. That's true. Um, I actually provoke people quite often by saying, I still believe that in 2020, we are negotiating like we did in 1850. Uh, for the simple reason that exactly as you're pointing out, John, so many people today perceive negotiation as basically a combat situation. It's, it's mm -hmm. a competitive situation where I win at your expense. And uh, I'm heading an organization today that was established in 1976 with a single purpose. And that's actually trying to change the mindset on how we a perceived negotiation because we can do it so much better and we can do it so much better by changing that mindset and and looking at negotiation as a collaboration and obviously i'm not saying we should become naive that's not that's not the key thing but by changing from that narrow-minded thinking of nego uh, collaboration or negotiation as a zero sum i'm sure everybody knows that term and and changing that into partnership or as i call it smartnership can actually make everybody more successful <laughs> That's smartnership. Um, yeah, because let's face it, I mean, you can go through, say, a, a sales situation, either as a customer, as a prospect, or as the seller, and you get into the process and everything's going well, and you're collaborating and you're learning about the, the solution or whatever it is, and things are going smartly. And then you know that there's a point when you're going to negotiate the commercials, right? And it's almost like the atmosphere completely changes at that stage because you sort of forget everything that went before and you both kind of retrench and get ready for this combat. So how, how do you avoid getting in uh, that mindset and how do you create a situation where people can actually negotiate for a win-win outcome for both sides? That's a very important question because one thing is obviously having a toolbox and the tools um, that would enable you to do collaboration. Another thing is changing the mindset of your counterpart. So it's an excellent question because obviously one thing I've learned throughout life, it's, it's pretty hard to change other people's thinking, right? Mm -hmm. It's even hard sometimes to change your own. Um, anyway, back to your question, John. One way we have to do this is actually, and I'm saying something that may sound a little awkward, but we have to negotiate on how we're supposed to negotiate before we start negotiation. And the reason that we have figured that out is that you and I, and perhaps everybody else on the face of the globe, perceive negotiation quite differently. Um, you might be seeing negotiation like playing tennis, and I might perceive negotiation as, as playing chess. Because, you know, United Nations in New York has never ever declared an international standard on how we are supposed to negotiate. So we mm -hmm. all arrive at the conference table with different belief on how we're going to negotiate. So what I'm always telling my students and clients is that we have to sit down with our counterpart before we actually start negotiation and talk about how we're going to negotiate. And that means we have to list the variables, the items we have to negotiate. We have to discuss if we want to be open, transparent, and honest. And this may sound weird, but trust is so essential 
in order to become more successful. We have to discuss what happens if trust is declining. Can we verbalize that? We have to, to discuss how do we split the potential value created. We have to, to discuss a number of variables. And when I say that, some people may think, oh, this sounds complicated, but no, it actually makes negotiation easier because suddenly we have a set of rules on how we play, are playing the game. Imagine two, two teams in, in whatever sport we are, we are talking about, John, that would, that would come into the field and neither of them have any idea on what the rules of the game might be. You know, that, that's unthinkable, isn't it? Uh, and that's basically what people are doing every single day when they're negotiating. They have no clue how they're going to play the game and neither does the counterpart. Yeah, I, I'm, I love that because uh, uh, number one, uh, it means that you have to, as you said, trust. It means that you have to be very transparent and open at the beginning of the process if you're going to talk about the negotiation before you've even got to that phase of it. I mean, and that and that takes some confidence and nerve to do that, right? Because yes. again, like you said, your counterpart may never have experienced this this type of approach before. Yeah, in in most cases, not. So how do you so so how do you build the confidence and 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 to do this in an elegant way as opposed to sort of just surprising somebody and they go and I have no idea what this guy's doing here. Um, one of the ways is a simple thing that actually complicated trust. I, I mentioned that before, and, and trust mm -hmm. is so essential. I think we can all agree that trust is, is is essential. But you know, when I talk to clients and audiences and students about trust, everybody nod their head and say, yeah, 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 trust is important. And then we just go on in our ways and we don't really think through what should we do. Now, I think we can agree that trust is not coming from something we're saying because everybody's going around the world and say, oh, I'm trustworthy and we got the best, mm -hmm. most trusted product in the world. And everybody goes, well, you know, it's, it's kind of commercialized the word trust. So trust mm -hmm. is not coming from what we're saying. Trust is coming from actions, right? So if I'm telling you and you and I are going into a collaboration, if I'm telling you, um, I, I, wanna, I want you to trust me, that's not enough. I have to prove to you, I have to show you that you can trust me. So. Back to the rules of the game, you know, negotiating on how we are going to negotiate. I may have to be the first one to open up, to sacrifice myself just a little bit. And what is interesting in, in more than 35 years of experience, uh, John, is that we have found that openness often mirror openness in negotiation. If we find that openness to be credible and honest and sincere, we very often respond positive to somebody who is honest and transparent. There will be a few cases obviously, where well, that openness will be abused. But I can promise you it pays off taking that risk because in most cases, you know, you don't necessarily have to go through with all negotiations. And a successful negotiation, by the way, could be one where you don't reach an agreement. I mean, if not reaching an agreement is worse than reaching an agreement, then you have been successful in a negotiation as well. So it's really, it's really down to, to, to trust. And by the way, if I could add one more comment, yeah. trust is a monetary value. And think about it this way. If you have a high level of trust in any kind of relationship, your transaction cost will go down and the profit for everybody will go up. But on the other hand, if trust is low in any kind of relationship, transaction cost will go up. And what is transaction cost? That's lawyers, contracts, yeah. security, all of that. And your profit will go down. So we can actually put a value on trust. So we have renamed trust in negotiation into trust currency. Obviously just the two word trust and currency we put mm -hmm. together because we can put a value on trust. Yeah, and, and I love what you're saying here, um, especially about the economic value of trust, but also uh, the point about, uh, about trust has to be gained through actions. And the other part that you mentioned there, which I love, is that psychological thing about mirror, mirroring, I think is the word, is like if I open up and I'm, you know, show that I'm willing to be transparent and all of that, it, it kind of transfers onto you. You feel comfortable doing the same. It's like if I smile at you, you're more likely to smile back at me. If I look, if I sort of frown at you, you're more likely to frown back at me. Sure. So somebody has to lead the dance. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and I recommend, obviously, my audience that sometimes they have to, to, to take charge. Um, so, so that's, that's very, that's very, very important having a focus on that and having that planning and that strategy in place before you step into any, any negotiation whatsoever. What are some of the ways though that can derail a, a negotiation, even if you do everything right up to that point, what are some of the missteps you can take and how can you correct them or even avoid them? There are millions. Uh, have we got four hours? Because <laughs> really, there's so many ways where, where our negotiations go haywire completely. Um, I would say the most important one, if I should try and prioritize, would probably mm. be the lack of listening. 
Um, people in general, including myself, I'm no better than anybody else, yeah, we are not really good at listening. Sometimes we are more occupied thinking about what am I going to say next than actually mm -hmm. listening to what you're saying. So what I have spent a lot of time on is actually researching into how do we do that properly? How can we actually convert that into a tool? And one way that I figured out works is actually replacing the word of the counterpart, what they're saying with the sound of a cash register. And, I, and I'm, I'm not saying it in a way where it should be perceived funny because it's actually sure. serious because yeah. people in negotiation typically only raise a topic if it means something to them, right? Right. So they will yeah. raise a topic because there's a cost involved or there's a benefit involved or there's a, a, a liability involved. You know, there's some kind of issue. So when we hear somebody ask for something, we shouldn't immediately go into a no mode. We can't do that. We shouldn't go into a yes mode either because that will be mm -hmm. what we call unilateral concession. What we have to do is ask more questions. So back to your question, when do I see negotiation goes bad? Very often if we don't show an interest in the counterpart. And by doing that, we'll ask questions. A really superior negotiator, John, ask questions, lots and lots of questions. Not that it turns into an interrogation, but if you raise a topic, for instance, saying, could you deliver two weeks earlier? My question mm -hmm. to you would be, why would you like that? What's your benefit? W would it save you money? Blah, 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 whatever. So a qualified negotiator will leave the negotiation with an enormous amount of, of knowledge about the counterpart. And back to your question again, the reason I see a lot of negotiation fails is because we don't really see the purpose and the interest and the cost and the liability and all of that for the counterpart. We are just there being completely selfish, just focused on what can I gain? How can I save cost and all of that instead of focusing on the counterpart? Yeah, because I always think that sometimes we forget, particularly in B2B sales, like how much uh, is riding on the part of the buyer. Oh, yeah. uh, when, you make, when you make a purchase, uh, uh, when you make a purchase for your organization, it can be career enhancing if it works out really well. It can be career limiting if it turns out to be a disaster. So there's a lot of emotion already tied up in it. And to your point, if I raise an issue during the negotiation and you're not, you're, you kind of miss it or you dismiss it or you just say, no, we don't do that and you move on you are, as you say, missing a great opportunity to understand maybe the things that are playing on my mind that will actually make me feel more comfortable in the long run. And what I often, I completely agree, John, and what I often see is that we have a tendency to shoot something down if it costs us money. And mm -hmm. here comes another important thing that um, in generally will make everybody more successful. That's a concept we have coined called and uh, negoeconomics, which basically just means nego uh, negotiation economics. And that is the difference between your cost and my value or my cost and your value. So let's say just back to my stupid example on, on delivery time. If you are asking me if I could speed up delivery time by two weeks, I would ask mm -hmm. you, what's the value to you? Now, let's say that my cost of speeding up delivery time is $20,000, right? But your mm -hmm. value of getting it two weeks earlier is $30,000. Then we have $10,000 in between us. That is necroeconomics. In so many real negotiation, that potential of necroeconomics is being lost because I'm not willing to take on additional cost of $20,000 and we're not exchanging the values. You're not telling me what your value is if mm -hmm. we change delivery time and I'm not telling you what the cost is. So we're just basically sitting there looking for a very dark cat in a very dark room without knowing what we are discussing, right? So you're asking for two, two weeks speed up and I'm just turning that down saying that's impossible, we can't do it, not, not interested not knowing that you actually have a benefit in us doing that. So um, back again to your question, that's, that's one of the many, many reasons that, that negotiation go, goes up. Yeah, no, I, I, I love that idea of the, about the fact that uh, you, uh, you could be leaving money on the table by just shooting things down because in fact, they may be willing to pay more for that extra benefit and, and, yep. you can, and then you have a, a happy customer, you're fulfilling something that perhaps other people can't fulfill. Exactly. Uh, but you would miss, but to your point about listening and exploring, you would miss that if you just shoot it down without exploration. If I could add one more thing, I know we have a yeah. limited amount of time, John, but what I often see is that a lot of negotiators negotiate too few variables. And a variable mm -hmm. uh, is obviously everything that is negotiable. So that could be warranty, that could be delivery time, that could be warehousing, it could, you know, whatever. Um, too many negotiators out there are just negotiating price. You know, that always mm -hmm. seems to be the holy grail price. They yep. negotiate price, terms of payment, warranty, and perhaps one or two more things. That's it. That's the commercial number of variables they are negotiating. Just to give you a quick example, I was sitting with a major European manufacturer 
of wind turbines uh, a couple of months ago. And, you know, wind turbine park could easily cost $100,000 or a million dollars or, you know, a lot of money. Um, but typically when they were negotiating one of those wind turbine packs, they were negotiating on nine commercial variables, right? And we did a very quick brainstorming exercise with that company and it took less than three hours. And after three hours, we had created 72 commercial variables. Wow. And immediately after that, they implemented 26 of those variables and improved the bottom line by 12%. Not because they were brilliant or we were brilliant, but simply because we just expanded the pie. So the second we start to negotiate more than what we typically would negotiate on, we just have more room to maneuver, right? And I meet so many industries and businesses, John, when I'm, when I'm provoking them and saying, we need to, to negotiate on more variables, a typical answer I'm getting, you could probably figure out what that is. Now we, we, we don't have any, anything else than that. And the yeah. only thing the customer is interested in is price. Yes, and I'm yes. saying, what a load of BS, because I don't mm -hmm. believe that, you know? Yes, the customer is interested in price, but there are so many other things that will give value to this case and we need to, to negotiate them as well. So anyway. Important. Yeah, no, that, that was a great point. And, and it really underlines what you said before is you don't know what's of value to the customer unless you've actually talked about it. Mm. Right. So, I mean, if you haven't brought any of these things up and you haven't discussed, you don't know whether they're valuable or not. Exactly. Exactly. They're very important. Yes. Yeah. Well, this has been fantastic, uh, Kel. I really enjoyed this uh, conversation. All of Kel's information will be in his contributor bio below here. Uh, but before we go, please do tell people a little bit more about you and what you do. Well, very briefly, I am an associate professor at Thunderbird School of Global Management uh, locally here in Arizona. They are now part of Arizona State University. I am also a professor at a university, Auburn University in Denmark and BMI Institute in Belgium and Lithuania. Um, when I'm not lecturing at university, I'm a keynote speaker. I speak around the globe when there's not a pandemic, obviously. Otherwise, I spend too much time on Zoom online. Uh, so I think I, I'm suffering from Zoom fatigue, which is becoming a, a thing right now. Mm -hmm. And uh, then I'm an author, obviously. And then I run a consultancy company where we help advise and support our clients globally on negotiations. So that could be anything from sales, procurement, project management, uh, merger acquisitions. So we basically act as a coach to the team and um, hopefully help them improve their, their negotiations. That's fantastic. Well, listen, thanks again, Kel, for joining us. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop Online, Sales Magazine, Pipeline CRM. See you all for another expert interview really soon. Thank you. Yeah.